Hi, how are you doing? My name's Chris. I'm going to be your instructor for this Unreal Engine course. And today we're going to be looking at the very basics, basically starting up with Unreal Engine, looking at the launcher, looking at some basic project settings, and just getting going. By the end, you'll know how to navigate inside of Unreal Engine and manipulate objects. And I'll even leave you with a little bit of work to do so you can, you know, experiment and try building some things for yourself. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the launcher right now. There we go. And this is what you get when you start Unreal Engine. So you should see this page here. Now, if I just nip into my system tray, I'm just going to uncheck that and go back. This is actually how it appears when you first get it. You'll notice there's a store and a library in the top, page, top left here. And that's because this is also the launcher for Unreal Engine's game library. So if you play Fortnite or if you do anything like that, then you access it through this. Now, you may well not mind about that, but if you're in a professional environment, um, then what you'll need to do really is turn that off by going into your settings and just clicking hide the game library. And by doing that, that will basically disable access to it. I mean, you can turn it back on again at any time, but also it will stop the pop-ups appearing from the store, encouraging you to play video games or buy video games, things like that. Okay, so it is one distraction gone and it does add that element of professionalism to it. Okay, so what a lot of people tend to do when they've got their launcher is they just tend to go, oh, library, Unreal Engine, let's get started. I always encourage my students to stop, take a breath and have a look and see what there is here, okay? Because I've used applications similar to this for well over 20 years. Now, Unreal Engine is slightly different in that its launcher actually has some fairly useful content, okay? And it's worth taking a moment to look at it and see what it is. So if we look here, we're on the news page of the launcher. And at the top, it's got the latest news now, 5.2 is now available. It's been available really for a month or, well, a couple of months now, actually. Um, by the time you're using this, there may be a new version of Unreal Engine out. That's okay, this is still very relevant, okay? Hasn't really changed what we're doing since, to be honest, back in version 4 point something. Now, underneath that, we have some icons. These are really important, okay, because one of the good things I think that Epic does that a lot of other websites and companies don't do is they don't, other companies don't provide you with a decent amount of training and support. Um, Unreal Engine has an amazing amount of support. Okay, so if I click on the YouTube button, for example, I'll just bring this down here, and you should be able to see that we have a lot of videos, okay? So they've got nearly a million subscribers and they've got 2.3 thousand videos. You've got things like, you know, previews of new stuff that's coming out. You've got their own coursework. You've got a lot of really, really cool stuff here that I do recommend taking the time to have a look at. Now on top of that, you've got Q and A's. And if I click on that and bring it down, let's give it a second or two to load. There we go. So these are just questions and answers. It's basically, a subsection of their forum but they've got a lot of people on there they encourage answering they encourage good community values so you don't need to feel stupid about asking questions they also have you know obviously a general larger broader scope forum where people are encouraged to post up what they're working on talk about things stuff like that and then finally if you're wondering about what's coming in unreal engine we also have the roadmap so if i click on that and that will bring up all the stuff that's currently being, you know, progressed. So for example, Unreal 5.2, this is all the stuff that's coming in, that's came in for 5.2. A lot of exciting stuff here. Anyway, let's move this out of the way. Get back up here again. There we go. Okay, so as well as the basic news, okay, that we've got at the top and the little buttons and stuff, we've got additional stuff here. So there's spotlights, there's um, little things here like upcoming featured content. For example, I can see here that today, is this today? June, no, this was a week ago. We've got a deep dive into the Electric Dreams environmental sample project. Um, I'm gonna have to grab that because that's fascinating. That's all about procedural workflows, okay? Building procedural systems that populate levels to make your job a lot easier. Fascinating stuff. 
Um, they normally have a you know a three or four person panel with a couple of experts discussing it, a couple of people asking questions. Really good stuff. Next to that, they've got a challenge. They like to challenge people. Okay, so you'll get these lovely challenges where everyone will enter at all sorts of different levels. There's a lot of community encouragement there. I recommend it. You know, don't be shy. Um, shy people get nothing. Now, we've also got a few featured screenshots from people's projects. You know, you want to try and get on there. It's a great way for people to get you to get people looking at your project. And then we've got slightly older news as we go down, 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 down. So some really cool stuff there. OK, let's take a quick hop across to the next one, samples. OK, so in here we have the samples that you can download for free for Unreal Engine. Now, they're not included in the basic install of Unreal Engine. And you may be thinking to yourself, well, that's pretty rubbish because the install was huge. Understandable, but these are bigger, okay? So, for example, we have the city sample here. You may have seen that with the uh, Matrix Awakens demo on the PlayStation 5 and so forth. This is the assets from that. This is the entire city in high detail, just so you can download it, take it apart, look at it, see how it works. Fantastic projects about 100 gigs in size. So that's why they're all on here for you to download. Remember the Electric Dreams environment I was talking about? There it is there. If I just click on it, it'll take me to its page and I can literally just press the button to create a project from that. 68 gigs, but again, massively high detail. This is all about building really high detail objects inside of Unreal Engine in these cases. And so what it's doing is it's giving you some really, really, really high polygon assets. It's giving you all the project files, and just letting you have a crack at it yourself. Very worth doing, but don't leap into it until you're ready because you're gonna find that it overwhelms you. You tend to get a little bit kind of, oh no, look at all the stuff. I mean, I'm the same, okay? I'm still holding off on having a look at the Electric Dreams project because I'm busy kind of reading up more about it. I'm going to download it in my own time, though, because I am looking forward to it. Anyway, let's get back to samples. Now, there's lots of stuff here, you know, machine learning to form a samples, content examples, etc. The one I do suggest you download and have a good luck at, once you're used to, you know, once, maybe a couple of lessons in, once you're a little bit used to Unreal Engine, have a look at these content examples. What this will give you is basically a big room that you can walk around in and try out different functions of Unreal Engine, just to see what they do. And a good thing about this is that, like most of the things inside of Unreal Engine samples, you're allowed to use them, okay? What I mean is you're allowed to use them yourself. You can adapt them. You can build on them. You can use them in your own projects. You don't just have to look at them and go, oh, that's good. I'll never have a clue how to do it. No, you can build on it. You can adapt on it. You can make it into your own tool, and then you can put it inside your own project as long as it's inside of Unreal Engine 5. And you're fine with that. There are some caveats. Caveats, that means, you know, there are some things you can't do. For example, the Electric Dreams environment. Um, I don't know if they're including it in there because I haven't had a chance to look at the file. But uh, there is a big electric truck. And I know you're not allowed to use that. You're also, you know, various things that are copyrighted in there. They do get noted. So it'll say if you can't use something commercially in your own project or whatever. So do have a look at what it says, but 99 times out of 100, if they give you something to use, you can rip it apart and use it in any way you want. Now, if you're interested in video games, by the way, these three samples here, the Valley of the Ancient, that's the demo you may have seen when Unreal Engine was being announced and really, really cool stuff, big boss and fighting. You've got the Stacko bot here, which is a fun little kind of platformer that will teach you how to get set up for playing platform games. And you've got this Lyra starter game. And the Lyra starter game is kind of a multiplayer run and shoot game. Um, what I like about this is they update it constantly based on the new material that's coming out inside of Unreal Engine. So anything that's new that gets added to this, the project you know, updates, and you've got all the new features inside of it. This is a great one. I know a lot of people who make first-person games who are just starting out, they tend to kind of disassemble this and look at it. So don't feel afraid to take these projects and look at them. Now, if we go a little bit further down, we can see that we have the uh, legacy samples. So this is stuff that was made for earlier versions of Unreal Engine. In this case, you know, obviously version 4. I'm just having a sip of water. Hmm. Now, 
Um, these still, for the most part, will work. Okay, there's nothing really stopping these working. But the reason they're legacy samples is because, you know, a lot of the technology they're using now has been outdated. So, for example, this shooter game, which was the first kind of templated shooter game, has now been superseded by the Lyra starter game. So, But it doesn't stop you from going in there. And on top of that, you'll find some really nice models that you can sequester and use, you know, for your own projects, have some fun building things up with them. So it's definitely, definitely worth doing. Okay, let's go all the way back up to the top here and we'll look at Marketplace. Just let it load because the Marketplace sometimes takes a moment or two. There we go. Okay, now the Marketplace is a little bit of a mixed bag, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, what I mean by that is that, like anything, it's great to be able to save time. Okay, time definitely does equal money in a lot of cases. Your time is valuable. My time is valuable. So, if you're going to spend, you know, eight hours, 16 hours or something building something that you can purchase for maybe £10 or $12 or whatever, then great. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. And there's some really good stuff inside of the marketplace. So you'll see, I mean, we get every month we get a selection of free things that you can just see here. And there's also some discounts. And then you get new releases, and then everything's in kind of categories after that, like industry and what it is, and so on and so forth. Well, that's great. But one thing I'll warn you about at the minute is that the kind of the quality management inside of the marketplace is a teeny weeny bit variable. There's a lot of stuff here that's kind of questionable, like, you know, beach bundle boys and girls and so forth. So do be aware of that. Now, that's not to say that, you know, you may not be wanting to make a game that has beach bundle boys and girls. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is check out the assets if you can. Look at previews. Most things tend to have, you know, a review. They have a star rating. I tend to look at things, avoid them if they don't have at least plenty of good reviews and a good star rating. Obviously, the new stuff won't tend to have that. So do keep an eye out on your products check their ratings, etc., etc. Things that have been in the free, okay, these ones will be free for a month, tend to have fairly high ratings because everyone likes free things. Just a little head point of that. Okay, so as well as these, if I go at the free here, we also have the Mega Scans. Now, Mega Scans is um, part of a company that was called Quixel, and Quixel is now part of Epic Games. And so they bought all of these assets from Quixel. And it used to be that you used to have to purchase these. Okay, so each of these things, like the chopped wood, you'd purchase that for, you know, $10 or whatever. And then it'd be added to your library. But because Epic purchased Quixel Megascans, you could download and use all of their assets free of charge inside of the Unreal Engine. And that's really, really cool. I mean, if you look at this, we've got entire collections here. So, for example, this is a collection of quarry assets. And this is everything you need to start building this kind of setup in really, really high detail. You've got kind of Mesa rocks and all sorts of cool stuff there. So it's very, very worth looking at. They've even got small items here, look, like this medieval-style um, anvil or these military equipment boxes or these burnt paper debris. You've got lots and lots of things here. So there's lots and lots of tools, lots and lots of assets that you can use to put into your projects. So that's really cool. Okay, so the last, last button is our library. And if I go into my library here, you'll see that I have my engine versions at the top, my projects that I'm working on here. And then underneath that, I've got a vault that contains everything that I've purchased from the store or been given for free or whatever. They're all inside of here, okay? Now, interesting thing, just to point out to you, you've probably got nothing in here, that's okay. Now, if you've got a little I just above something just here, it means there's an update. So whoever it is that's created this has gone to the trouble of building an update for a newer version of Unreal Engine. So you can click update and it will update it inside of your project library. And then, sorry, your Unreal Engine library. And then you can add it to any of your projects at any time. And adding something to your project is really easy. All you need to do is... In this case, let's say I'm using this animated rain water droplet material and I want to add it to a project. I just click add to project and just click which one I want it added to. Just as simple as that. 
I'll click Don't Add in a minute. Now, what to do if you don't see that you've got an engine version here? Because the engine isn't automatically installed. You've just got the launcher. Well, that's OK. Just click on Plus. Now, I've already got 5.2 and 5.1, so it will ask you if you want to install the most recent version that you don't have installed. In my case, 5.0.3. Well, that's cool. But if you look by clicking the arrow, we can go back all the way to 4.0.2. So all the versions of Unreal Engine going all the way back are available to us. Now, it won't give us versions 3, 2, or 1. There's a reason for that, and that's to do with the licensing of those products. But version 4 and version 5, you can download those, use them. It's fantastic. And a real step back in time, to be quite honest for me, going back and using things like 4.4 and so on. Anyway, if you change your mind, just click on the little X, that'll remove it. And you can do the same for a fully installed engine, but be wary, if you've got projects that are linked to it, then you'll have to reinstall the engine again if you want to use them. Now, let's talk about these four projects that I've got here, because you might not have any projects in your folder at the minute, and that's fine. Now, this one's my actual active project. This is the wiki that I'm working on. Next to that, I've got my TPS AI kitchen. Um, that's just a name that I call it. It's cute. This is just a, a project I've built for working on artificial intelligence stuff. Okay. Um, by that, I don't mean what you're reading about in the news or whatever with chat GPT. I mean, game AI, you know, things that patrol, things that chase after you, things that interact with you. What I'll do is I'll build those in their own area usually. And then when they're working, I'll clean them up and then send them into a project. Over here, this is a project I did for a talk in the Netherlands. And then over here is basically my, this is my practice session for recording this set, learning set one. Now, I don't want this because I'm going to re-record it. But you'll notice if I right click, we don't have any option to delete it. So what I can do is just get rid of it by going to show in the folder. That was a right click there. And before I get rid of it, let's talk about the actual structure and setup of these Unreal Engine files, because this is kind of important, okay? So, what we have here is what Unreal Engine Epic Games call OFPA, one file per actor. What that means is that you may be used to, um, and I'll just bring up, oh, that's the wrong one, I'll bring up Microsoft Paint for this, because I do love Microsoft Paint. All my students love it when I get out Microsoft Paint. There we go. So, if you're using something like 3ds Max or Maya or Blender or Photoshop or anything like that, then it's entirely possible that when you save, you'll get one file. Okay, so if you're using 3ds Max, you get your Max file. And that's it. Now, your Max file may refer to a few textures that you've applied to it. But all the work is carried out on this Max file here. Now, this isn't the same in Unreal Engine. An Unreal Engine, let's take the example of a chair. And you're going to love my picture of a chair here. So there you go. There's a chair. Look at that beauty. Okay, I put a little back thing on it there too. Okay, so you would think that this chair would be one file. But it isn't. What we actually have is we have a container first. Okay, and our container is the file that basically assembles all the other files. It says, this file is such and such, this file is such and such. Now our container, one file, will contain, in this case, our FBX. Okay, so I've got an FBX of my chair. And FBX is the most commonly used kind of input format. Okay, so now I've got two files. Now my chair also needs to have material on it. So our material is technically a container. So let's put the material in here. And that's now three files. Now my material will need some textures to come into it. And because Unreal Engine is what we call a PBR, has what we call a PBR renderer and a PBR material system, physically based rendering, we will normally have a diffuse texture. We will have a metal. We will have a glossiness. And we will have a the other one, which I've always forgotten. The title will probably specular, I think it is, off the top of my head. I keep forgetting what they are. Anyway, so that's four, five, six, seven for one chair. 
seven files, okay? Now, the reason this is important is because of this. Let's imagine your material file here is named something and you decide to change the name of it. If I went over here, content, uh, let me see, starter content, props, and I found the material, so let's say mlamp in this case, and I changed its name from mlamp to toothpaste. Now this is broken, okay? And this is broken because this FBX, which is linked into this container file, is going to be looking for a file called m underscore whatever the heck of its name was previously, uh, lamp. That's not there anymore. Because that's not there anymore, it can't access this one, this one, this one, or this one. So what it will do instead is it will put in a blank material and automatically assign it. So you know that there's an issue. So what this means is we can't mess around inside of Windows Explorer. We can't go renaming things. We can't go and go tidy things up. So, oh, brilliant, I'll tidy this up. New folder, tidy. Uh, I can't just drag things into this, you know, to make things tidy the way I want them to. It's going to break stuff. Unreal Engine will have no idea where you put them. It doesn't work that way. So don't mess around inside of Windows Explorer. Don't rename things inside of Windows Explorer. Don't do any of that. It has to be done inside of Unreal Engine itself. There are a few things you can do, but they're kind of at your own risk. So be aware of that. Now, remember what I said there, I'm going to actually delete the contents of this folder. So inside of Unreal Engine, my folder, which is inside of my documents folder, by the way, I can see here, here is learning set one, which I need to get rid of. So if I click on that and just hit delete, it's gone. Fab. Okay, so I don't need to worry about that now. I can set up a new project. But if we look down here, this doesn't update in real time. It's not constantly interrogating my folders to see what's there. Even if I hit F5, nothing. So what I usually do is close it down, relaunch it, which only takes a few seconds. There we go. And if I go to my library now, there, it's gone. Okay. Just like here, it's gone. One last thing then before we go into Unreal Engine and actually start digging around and, you know, playing with things, let's get used to it, is the amount of files and the amount of space you're going to need. Now, whilst you're just learning, you won't need a whole lot of space. But if you're on a laptop, for example, that only has 128 gigs or 256 gigs, or if you're on a PC that has low storage, really consider investing in more storage. Also, it's definitely worthwhile using an SSD, a really fast one. I use an M2, and to be honest, it makes all of the difference because you've got all these different files while you're in edit mode, kind of loading and unloading, loading and unloading, and you really need that fast access to your hard disk drive. I mean, if we look, my TPS AI kitchen, that's fairly small, so if I do properties, 572 megabytes, and that's a small folder, and it contains how many files? 353. If I do the same on the wiki, well, you kind of get an idea here. I think when it finishes counting, it's something like 180,000 files and like 180 gigabytes or something crazy like that. Okay, and all these files are referenced by the files, and that's why a nice fast hard disk drive is important. Now, the wiki is an old project. By that, I mean it's four years old and still ongoing, and so it's bound to be big. Okay, after a while, photo projects that you're using a lot of photo real assets in get huge. Don't panic. Okay, so we've talked enough about that. Let's just click this launch button for 5.2.1, which is the current most recent version. Now, what it's going to do is it's going to check its prerequisites. It's going to check it's got everything that it needs in order to launch properly. And when it does, it will then present us with a template window because it doesn't go off and straight away make us an empty project in Unreal Engine. It actually gives us some options on how we want our empty project to be before we start on it. And this is really, really important, especially for someone like you learning Unreal Engine because it takes some of the work away for you. So let's bring this down. Right, so here's our Unreal Engine project browser. 
and this will allow me to load up any one of my existing projects so I can load them up from here. But if I go down, oh, by the way, if you look at the bottom there, you can see 5.1, 5.1 and current. That means the 5.2 engine that I already opened. If I go to games, here we have seven templates for creating or rather starting the creation of a video game. And I'm just going to talk about them because each of these has different features in it that you may find useful and that you may want to obviously have a bit of a tinker with to do your own thing. Now, the first one's blank. That literally means blank, okay? So what it's gonna give you is a clean entry project. There'll be no pre-existing blueprints in it. There'll be no pre-existing special models in it, nothing. There won't even be a character control system inside of it. So if you go in there and you click the little play button at the top of your menu, basically you're just gonna be sat there floating in the middle of space. Um, it will provide a floor for you, but that's it, okay? And that's only for your own reference, nothing else. So this is what you usually use if you want to start creating everything from scratch or if you're importing a lot of perhaps pre-purchased uh, assets in for, you know, that have already got control systems or whatever, blank system. Now, much easier when you're starting out to start with one of the other ones. So, for example, we have a first person here, and the first person one is exactly that. It's a first person game template. It will allow you to start off as if it's a game. We also have the third person game template. Again, third person game template. That's what it is. We have a top down template. We have a basic vehicle template here. Handheld artificial reality, which is great, or augmented, they call it now. It was artificial years ago. And VR for virtual reality. So we have all these different things. Going down, if you're interested in things like film and video or architecture or automotive or simulation, we also have various options for those. And if you want to specialize, we do have stuff on specialization for these. And, you know, we'll go over that more. I do encourage you not to go straight into using these, even if this is your interest, because of basically plugin structure. Now, what this means is that if we're loading in a game project, something like first person, third person, whatever, it's only giving us a very light set of plugins for Unreal Engine. It's not giving us a lot of heavy stuff. It's not giving us all of the VP stuff. It's not giving us, you know, heavy camera stuff. It's not giving us anything like that. It's just giving us a nice, simple, clean project with minimal functionality and we can add functionality ourselves. If on the other hand, we go down to something like architect and go, oh yeah, I really want to be an architect. I'll have Archviz, create. It's gonna take a while to create this project because it's gonna bring everything in. Coupled with the fact that it's got a load of really high settings on here for things like the sun and stuff like that, that you may not understand yet and you may not understand why it's dragging your system down. So it's worth starting off with the games and then building up from there. Now. Good thing is that because this is all just the same engine, because this is Unreal Engine, we could start off with a first person project and we could introduce all the features that are inside of the architecture template, strip away all the lower detail stuff and have nothing but you know, beautiful path tracing, and ray tracing and all that kind of fantastic stuff because it's all the same engine. It's just the difference is that we're starting with less features and adding them rather than starting with all the features and removing them. A bit like going into a restaurant and ordering every single damn thing on the menu and then wondering why you can't finish it all, okay? This is the same thing. Okay, so we're going to make something and we're going to use the third person. Now, why third person? Because a lot of what we do in video games is about, you know, getting the sense of scale right. And the same thing is true as well in architecture, film, video, etc., etc., etc. Okay, so if I use third person, it's very easy for me to preview the size of things. I may know the size of things already inside of the game, but I get a good idea of it because I really do encourage you to use what I call your artist's eye and really look at what it is you're doing. Now, down here, when I'm creating it, let's have a look at some of these options. So we've got Blueprint and we've got C++. I'm going to encourage you to work almost exclusively in Blueprint simply because coming at this as an artist, you're going to find it a lot easier. If you already have Blue uh, C++ skills, fantastic okay you're going to love this even more but blueprint is more than enough why because what unreal engine does is it converts blueprints natively to c++ when we compile now what is a blueprint 
A blueprint is like visual code. Um, if you've ever done any form of visual code like Spark or so on, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's basically like a uh, it's basically like a flowchart, you know. This, then this, then this, then this is the best way of explaining it. So we'll be using blueprints extensively throughout um, you know the upcoming lessons, and so we're going to stick with that. Now, target platform, desktop. If we were building for mobile, then we'd select mobile because there's different features that would get installed with it and different settings. But we're doing desktop for the moment. Quality preset, maximum or scalable. Choose maximum. Scalable, really, we'd choose if, again, we were working for things like mobile. Also, we may want to look at things like scalable if we were working with consoles. But to do that, you would need a console development license before you even got near to kind of doing stuff for that. Okay, the last two options, starter content and ray tracing. Now, I'm going to tick starter content, and that'll give us some props that have been inside of Unreal Engine since about 4.06. They're old props, but you know what? That's fine. They'll work, and they've got features in it that are useful for us. And then underneath that, we have ray tracing. Ah, lovely sip of water. Now, ray tracing, you probably know what ray tracing is. That's basically accurate calculation of lighting by calculating ray bounces and things like that. I don't want you to turn it on at the moment. You may think to yourself, oh, ray tracing is going to look fantastic, etc. It does. But we're going to walk before we run. And if we turn on ray tracing, a couple of things. Firstly, a load of different settings inside of Unreal Engine will be on, so we won't be on the same page. Secondly, it will take it a lot longer to load up because it has to rebuild all of the shaders when you start Unreal Engine if you're using ray tracing. Um, the shaders are materials, and each shader is like a piece of software. So if you imagine... You know, you've got maybe a hundred material shaders inside of your project. If it has to rebuild those for ray tracing, it's got to go and compile a hundred of them. And that can take a while, even on a fast system like the one I'm using. So do please be aware of that. Okay, let us continue. So let's give this a name, and I'm going to call this Lesson 1, that's what it is, and hit Create. Now, when I do that, you may not be able to see it because it's kind of up in the top corner because I've got lots of monitors but what it's doing is it's initializing so it's copying across all the basic files that you need into the folder now remember we talked about folders before again if you have an ssd this is a much much faster thing that's going to be happening here it'll do a very quick kind of shader compile um it'll build an empty scene and it's ready let's do a uh, there we go get it to the right window like so there we go. So there is Unreal Engine in all its glory. Now, for me, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Window, Load Layout, and I'm going to go to my default editor layout. You but I don't, because when I'm working, I use customized layouts. Okay, that's when I'm working on my own projects. So I've loaded up a standard layout, and this is what you should be seeing. Okay, when you load up Unreal Engine. Now, let's talk about what it is that we have here. Okay, we're going to be looking at this central area here. Now, if you remember what I said in the website blurb, you know, I don't do PowerPoints. I don't like them. I want you to get started on things straight away. So what can we get started on straight away? Well, I think the navigation is pretty darn important. So you see this little box here, this little blue box. Let's click on it. And when we do, you'll notice it highlights, and it's got some arrows coming off it. That's because we can now move it. We've selected it, and again, if you're used to other software, 3D software, if you select something, sometimes it's just selected. But in this, if you select it, it's going to be select and move, select and rotate, or select and scale. So I've selected this, and it is highlighted. And we have these move arrows showing that we can move this object. Now, I'm quite far away from this. I want to get a bit closer to it. How do I do that? Okay, so hold your mouse button down, your right mouse button down. Move your mouse around. It's like moving your head, or it's like moving in a video game. We're holding down, this is mouse look, your right mouse button. Now, when this is in the middle of my screen, I'm going to move towards it by pressing W. Just like in a video game, W goes forward. 
I'm just going to tap it until I'm nice and close. I've still got my right mouse button down, by the way. If I press W without it, it doesn't do that. Now, maybe I'm too close. Let's press S to get further back. W, S. What about going side to side? A and D. Up and down. E and Q. So W, S, A, D, E, Q. Suddenly, if you're in particular, you know, into video games, you can see that we can move around our scene really quickly and really easily using this system. And it allows us a lot of what I call focus. You know, it allows us to really get in close, really get in far away. That's fantastic. OK, so that's great. And if you look up here, select and translate objects is highlighted, this little thing here. Now, if we keep our mouse over it, you'll also see the letter W appears. That's because the letter W is the hotkey for it. So anytime I press the letter W, it will go into move mode. Next to that, we have a basic select object mode. That's Q, which is relatively recent. So Q, W, Q, W, select mode, select and move mode. Really, really useful. OK, so what do we do with this move mode? Well, exactly that. If you look, we have an x-axis, a y-axis, and a z-axis. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this on my x-axis. There we go. And I've just moved it across to here. Now I'll move on my y-axis. Or I can move on my z-axis. And I can put it through the floor if I want to, because 3D space is intangible. So, you know, it's only solid if we tell the player it's solid and if we build that functionality in. But in the editor, it's always intangible. We can always put things through other things. Now, you may be noticing, oh, it's it's kind of juddering when I move it. It's not moving smoothly. And that's because we have this, the snapping system on, OK? If I was to turn off the snapping system, we can move it any way we choose. Ooh, look at that. So much smoother. But there's a problem with, well, not a problem. There's, an, there's a reason that we use snapping, OK? And what it is, this thing here, this object is, and I'll load up paint again, because I know you love paint. This cube is 100 units by 100 units, OK? Most of the basic default items inside of Unreal Engine for testing purposes are kind of 100 units to make it easier. Now, if I've got this snapping set to 10, that means I need to move this 10 increments, and it will snap next to this one exactly. If I don't have snapping, however, turned on, and I make a copy of this, and to make a copy of this, I'll just do Control C, Control V, and drag it. Okay, so you can see how easy it is to get it right next to it using snapping. If I turn the snapping off, you can see it's much harder. Okay, I have to really kind of look at it and see if there's a gap in between it and all that kind of thing. Okay, so that's why. Snapping is a useful feature, but you do still want to turn it off, you know, to move things freehand, to give you that freehand kind of artist moving things kind of experience. But that is why we have it. Now, you'll notice these numbers here, 1, 5, 10, 5, 50, 100, 500, 1,000, 5,000, 10,000, because we can change the snap. If I just move it now on snap 100, it's moving 100 units. Now, what is 100 units? Well, one AU, not AU, sorry, one unit inside of Unreal Engine is one centimeter. Okay, so this is a one meter cube. And if we've got it snapping to 100, it's going to snap to one meter at a time. This is an important thing to know and know about, certainly when it comes to creating models or importing models as well. One unit, one centimeter. OK, that's really cool, Chris, you're saying to me. What else can you show me? Well, we talked a little bit about navigation, remember? We move backwards and forwards, left and right, up and down. There are other things we can do as well. Now, if, for example, I hold down my middle mouse button, you'll notice I can pan myself up and down, left and right. OK, so that gives me another area of control. If I hold down my left mouse button, this allows me to move backwards and forwards and lock my movement left and right. Okay, so this basically allows me to hover around at whatever level I'm at 
without clipping through the floor or whatever, and look left and right. So that's my left mouse button. If I hold both of my mouse buttons together, I again get the panel. Okay, so just a few things that we can do there. Another thing I can do is I can also zoom in on objects. Now, this often confuses people who have never used Unreal Engine before because you think, oh, zoom, Z. No, it's not Z. You need to press F for focus. Okay, so now I've pressed F for focus. If I hold down Alt on my left mouse button, I'll rotate exactly around the pivot center of whatever it is I'm focused on. Again, it gives me more control. Fantastically helpful. Okay, so let's go back to this fellow here. Click on it. There we go. And we still have our movement tool. And you saw earlier, I pressed Control C, Control V, and I made a duplicate of it. I don't need to just do it that way, though. Another thing I could do is I could just hold down Alt and drag. And that will create a duplicate of it, too. So Alt and drag. And because I've got this set to 100, it's dragging at 100 every time. If I set this to 10, I can Alt and drag it 10 units. And I can do it in any direction I choose. That's pretty cool. So what other features have we got? Well, we've got rotate. And that's just here. See, if I just mouse over, select and rotate objects, that's also the hotkey E. And just like before, we have three axes. So I can rotate it on the X axis, the Y axis, and the Z axis. And this is all about how we put together the assets inside of our scene. We start building our worlds just using these tools. So that's move, W, rotate, E, and the final one, R, scale. And scale, well, scale is a fantastic tool too because it allows us to scale out objects, scale in objects, and we can scale on multiple axes, so X and Y axis, or Y and Z axis, or all three axes at once, just by whichever part of the axis, or rather the... Uh, Gizmo we are grabbing just here. W, E, R. And there's an even faster way to cycle through these as well. So, you know, if I've got my right mouse button down and I'm zooming through my level, I can just tap space and it will shoot between these three. Now there's one other feature I want to explain while I'm here. Okay, so if I just move this around and let's say I'm gonna rotate my object and then move it to here. Now, now that I've rotated it, you'll notice my gizmo, my X, Y, Z here, is still facing the world direction. So this is pointing the X, Y, Z for the whole world. It's not facing the direction that the actual box has been turned in. If you want to adjust that, what we have to do is go up here where the picture of the world is and change that to a local coordinate system. And then we can manipulate the box on its local axis, okay, which obviously, gives us a much greater degree of control. We can turn that off and on, and we can use it in the rotate tool, but not the scale tool you'll notice. We can't scale that on the world axis. So these are really useful tools for us for if we wanted to, for example, create a staircase. So let's say I want to create a staircase at roughly a 45 degree angle. Then what I could do is I could just scale this in a bit make myself a stair like that. And because I'm on the local, now you'll notice I'm moving around a little bit fast. This is great, this gives us a chance to talk about another tool. Over here, I can adjust my camera speed. And let me just take that down to maybe 0.3. I've noticed the camera speed thing kind of shakes a little bit, there you go. And when I do that, my camera slows down, which allows, the, allows me to be more precise. There we go. I'll bring this down to floor level. You'll notice it's clipping through. That's okay. I'll just do that. Now it isn't because I turned off my snapping. And I can put another step on top of it. But what I need to do is turn on my local. There we go. And now I can just duplicate it. And I'll turn off snapping for duplicating because when I scaled it now, these aren't, well, these aren't blocks of 10. Okay, so one, two, three and now i have a simple staircase facing off in that direction just by reshaping a cube using the simple tools that we've got inside of unreal engine and at the same time it's given me a chance to talk about the camera tool you know the camera speed tool 
Now, what if you take the camera speed to the other direction? If I bring this to a three, I can move around much, much faster because it's three times faster than it usually is. So we've got different ways of adjusting the speed of our camera. Now, what if I want to be working on this, this fantastic staircase that I've got here, but I also want to divide some time on working way over here on the other side of the map on, I'll just grab a cube just to bring it over here. Come on cube, over here, oops, on this cube over here, okay? So let's just bring it in. Hello cube. Well, that's fine, okay? Because if I want to work between these two places, what I can do is I can put a bookmark in. So if I press control one, I now have a bookmark for this section. And if I now go over to this staircase and I do control two, I can now press one, two, one, two. And I can zoom between these two, two different areas on my map, no matter how far away they are, without having to re-navigate there. And I'll always arrive back in the same position again. Fantastically, fantastically useful. Okay. <clears throat> Pardon me. Now, that's just obviously, you know, our move, manipulate, and so on. But let's let's look at this a little bit further, okay, while we're here. So if I just click on one of these cubes, let's see what else has happened in our scene. Up here on the right, you can see I have this thing called an outliner. And I've got SM Chamfer Cube 8 has highlighted. Now, I'm going to make this a little bit wider because everything's customizable inside of Unreal Engine. And as I do, my viewport will come down. And let's see what we've got. Well, SM Chamfer Cube 8, and it's telling me it's a static mesh actor. Everything inside of Unreal Engine is technically an actor. This is a stage. This is our static mesh actor. Now, over here on the left, we've got two little objects. We've got a pin, and we've got an eye. The eye affects its visibility, so we can turn on and off objects that might be in the way. We might want to see behind them if we're working inside a cave, for example. We also have our pin here. Our pin allows us to pin the object or unpin it. That's really useful if we're using things like the world partitioning system where objects may not be loaded. And we'll talk about that more later. Now, as well as this though, I also have this thing down here, my details panel. Now these are two separate tools, okay? I could take my outliner and literally remove it and put it somewhere else if I want to, and just have my detail panel here because everything allows for snapping. I'm going to move this back up here again. And this is a description of everything inside of my SM Chamfer Cube that's editable by me. So you'll see here we've got our location, and this is the world location of our cube. So it's 150 units off the ground, 2,025 units on the Y off the center of the plane, and 943 units on the X off the center of the plane. And we can adjust this any way we want. So I could make this a thousand units, two thousand units, exactly 150 units. Okay, we have that level of precision. Now we also have the rotation tools here. So we could rotate this 22 degrees, 55 degrees, and 44 degrees. You know, we can rotate this any which way we want just by using the rotation tool or reset it. Now you'll notice there's a little reset property to default value here. So for example, if I set this to 12.5 all across the board there, I could then reset it to zero just by clicking the arrow. We can also change the scale. So let's say I want it in height two times, which would make, or width, sorry, two times, and height two times, I could now make it 200 by 200 by 200 units just by doing a simple scale. I could keep the others at one, I could keep the others at 0.5. Massive amount of control here, okay? This is one way of being able to start fast building levels is by just using these simple tools. Now going down, we have the actual static mesh it's using, SM Chamfer Cube. Okay, now if I was to click Browse To in Content Browser, that will actually bring up the location of the SM Chamfer Cube and the other tools as well, allowing us to drop them into our level just by dragging them in so we can bring in more aspects. Further down, I'll just ignore the advanced. We have the material. Remember I was telling you about materials? If I just browse to that as well, you can see we have this M solid blue here. And we'll talk about editing um, materials in a future. Don't worry too much about that. As I go down, we also have this button here, simulate physics. Now, see this staircase over here. 
all these blue objects have simulate physics turned on by default. Okay, that's just the way the scene is set up. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to press play. We're finally going to get to have a go inside of our level. So click play. Okay, you can also see that it took a moment or two for things to load. That's relatively normal. But physics has kicked in and basically these objects have fallen over. Now, it may be that you don't want physics enabled for certain objects, which is fine. So if I hit escape, play mode, what I do is I could select, and then I'm going to hold control to select more than one, all of the stairs. So there we go, I've selected all four. I could also select them over here on my outliner, select control and, you know, just like you'd multiple select in anything. When I do that, anything that's common will be in here. That means that anything that shares the same adjustable nature will be in here. And you can see simulate physics ticked. Let's turn that off. And now if I click play, But the stairs haven't, which means that I can now walk up them and use them like a staircase without any risk of me, you know, falling through them or whatever. Fantastic. This is some basics, okay? Now, if we scroll down a bit more, you can see we've got more stuff to do with physics. We're not going to get into that. Um, we've got stuff about lighting. We've got stuff about H-logs. Lots and lots and lots of options. Don't get overwhelmed by them, okay? For the minute, we're interested in just making something nice and simple. Now, you may remember that at the beginning of this, um, when we start, started creating the project, I said, we'll include some starter content. And there's a reason for that. If we come down here to the bottom left and press content draw, you'll see there's some folder navigation on the left here. And I'd like you to go into the starter content, just scroll down a little bit, and you can see here props. Now, these props are all static meshes that we can drag into to our scene. So for example, that chair, and you'll notice that I can use W, E, and R on this as well to make an enormous chair if I wanted to. And we can bring in any one of these assets. So all these basic props, these basic stairs, we could also go to a contour. And if I go to my architecture, we also have some basic walls and things like that. So let's say wall door 400 by 400. And I'll bring over wall 100, 400, 400. There. Okay, back to my scene in a minute. Now, what we can do with these is you can basically experiment and make yourself a nice simple scene. So I'll delete the chair. And what I mean by that is let's grab this piece of floor here, sorry, wall here. I'm just going to drag it to a clear space. And then Make sure snaps on. So I'll turn on snapping for my grid and I'll turn on snapping for my rotation. And I'm going to rotate this 90 degrees while holding Alt. There we go. I'll do it again. So I've got two copies. And then I'm going to move one of my copies over to this side. There we go. Then what I'll do is I'll take this part here and I'll do the same as well. Alt and drag. So now I've got this kind of chamber here. Now, you may have seen that, you know, I've got four doors here and no windows. What if I want to change two of these into windows? I've built something and it's like, that's in the right position. It's the right size, but it's not the right asset. That's okay. Let's select this one. So it's all select. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, just with this select, come down to my content drawer and I just I can replace my selected actor with wall window 400 by 400. There we go. And I can do that for all of these. I can even do multiple at a time by holding control, multiple selecting, right click, and place with. So we can multiple select actors. When we do, you will notice their name hasn't changed in our outliner. So you may want to change those yourself. We can't multi-change names at once, but we can select one and call it, you know, uh, what's this, wall window one, and then this one, 
select it manually wall window three and then this one would be wall window three and you'll notice that i'm using underscores instead of spaces unreal engine does not like that at all it does not like spaces so we're using underscores you're allowed to use them in certain aspects but certainly not in the names of actors now to speed things up a little bit, I'm going to change my scalability. So what I'm going to do is click this. And this is basically like the settings if you were using a video game. I'm changing mine from cinematic to high. And that means it's not going to be doing quite as much processing as it would do. OK, so this way it's not going to be quite glitchy and waiting a few seconds before we can do stuff. Down here, this thing that says bad size, you may not have built yours exactly where mine was. This is the player start. Anything that intersects the player start will stop the player from being able to start there. So I'll just move that out of the way and you'll notice now it's fine, that's gone. And I'm gonna hit save just to save everything. Now, what's this missing that it doesn't have? Well, it does not have a root, does it? So what I'm going to do, rather than use one of the architecture pieces, I'm just gonna go down to this shapes and let's see if we've got, here we go, we've got this shape quad pyramid. This looks like a good roof to me. Let's move it up to a suitable position. And I think if we scale it by four, and we could even scale down the roof on the Z axis to two, so it looks more like a normal house. There we go. And I'll just move it into position roughly like that. And now, if I go inside, you can see global illuminations working. It's giving us our lighting, you know, so we're getting our final, we're getting our gathers and our corner and all that kind of thing. If I hit play, we can move into and out of our house without a hitch, which is fab. And we still have all of our stuff over here. So what I would like you to do before we move on to the next section is I'd like you to have an experiment in this kind of playground yourself, okay? And what I would like you to do is I'd like you to build a bridge using these existing things to go over this gap here so that our player, when they come into the game, can go up here and across here and make it to this bridge over here, okay? Because it's quite far away. So I'd like you to build a bridge. Do it any way you want. You can use it using physics assets. You can use it static meshes that don't have physics whatever you prefer but make a little bridge across there make it as pretty as you like and i'll see you in the next lesson thanks very much for watching um i believe in the next lesson we'll be looking at doing some more advanced things to do with the interface we'll be talking about actor placement all sorts of cool things like that plus we'll be starting to look at mesh importation so till then thanks for watching and i'll see you in the next one bye bye for now